I think the most interesting conversations I'm having with corporations and institutions is in every conversation on sanctions, I ask them one question. Are you still struggling with compliance or are you moving to reputational damage? And it's about 50-50 where people are saying, I'm still struggling with compliance or I'm moving away from compliance. I'm going to reputational damage on this one. So I think sanctions have forever changed. I think now that we've got things like the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act, enforcement into that will continue to change the world. The question is, who enforces these types of new issues? I think we're moving towards a world where we've got better enforcement because that's going to make clear that we're serious about getting right the complexities of these sanctions. Welcome to one of the most important podcast series I've ever been associated with. Never the same business after the Ukraine war. In this five-part podcast series, along with my co-host Brandon Daniels, we explore how currents which have been percolating since at least the onset of the pandemic in 2020 came to fruition in February of 2022 when Russia invaded. In the five topics of supply chain, sanctions and AML, corruption as a national security issue, cybersecurity, and ESG, we will explore how businesses have changed literally forever with the advent of the conflict in Ukraine. These strains did not come out of nowhere. They have been in business bubbling up over the past two to three years, perhaps even longer. But now, compliance officers, business executives, legal eagles, and the government needs to understand that business has changed forever. And we're going to explore that in this podcast series. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox, back with Brandon Daniels, CEO at Exeter, for our exploration of how the world has changed. In this episode, we're going to take up sanctions and anti money laundering. Brandon, first of all, welcome back. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Brandon, one of the precursor or a couple of precursors to this topic were the increase in sanctions utilized by the Trump administration, economic sanctions against countries that the U.S. felt had abused our various trade positions. But most significantly, at least in my mind, was on January 1 when Congress overrode President Trump's veto of the National Defense Authorization Act and in that pass, the AML law of 2020, which was the first update of the AML laws and federal AML law since the Patriot Act was passed in the wake of 9-11. And so those, in my mind, set us for a change. And then Russia invaded Ukraine and the Biden administration came down along with most of the Western nations levying sanctions. So with that incredibly long-winded introduction, how has the world of sanctions and anti-money laundering changed in your mind since the Russian invasion? Yeah, I was just at a dinner with a few of our Congress people, some of our representatives. And the one thing that we talked about was the nature of sanctions and the nature of, you know, sort of punitive economic activities and ensuring that you're having the right impact, the right impact, and that you're not either missing the forest from the trees by not having sanctions that are comprehensive enough, but also making sure that you're not hurting your allies and partners that can help you unwind some of these undesirable or intolerable geopolitical situations. And so when I think about the sanctions that we implemented, I think it's not just about the economic sanctions that OFAC put out. It's about sort of this comprehensive set of economic and trade policies that have been codified into legislation, regulation, rulemaking that set the tone for sanctions in the future, sanctions and economic prohibitions in the future, right? So first of all, you have a comprehensive set of sanctions that have been focused on primarily companies that have engaged in activities that are adversarial to the United States industry or United States itself. Or the United States and its allies. 
but also you have things like NDAA 847, NDAA 889 that really look at our supply chains and start to say, hey, companies like Huawei and CTE, like China Telecom, which isn't in 889 yet, but is one of those companies that was just subject to an FCC ban. You know, if you have them in your supply chain, it's problematic, right? So you've got things like 889 that says, We've got information and communications technology and surveillance equipment that's coming to the government. If there's a Huawei chip in it, we don't want it. That's a new type of sanction because it's a little bit broader. It's a little bit more comprehensive. And it actually gets to the root of an issue, which is that economic, corporate espionage, intelligence gathering, and potentially disruption are all not just one tier away from you, not just found in transactions, but actually are found in the packaging that happens downstream in supply chain. So I think NDAA, the expansion of the uh, AML and sort of more comprehensive financial crime compliance changes and the establishment of things like Section 889, which bars, again, ZT, Dawa, Huawei, Hytera, those major manufacturers from the federal supply chain, recognize that this is not just a direct supplier, direct transaction issue. The second thing on sanctions and the comprehensive sanctions that we saw around China were that we were trying to prohibit the investment of United States foreign direct investment going into China and into specifically companies that had been notoriously connected with human rights abuses, with infringing upon the sovereignty of nations like Taiwan. And what we wanted to do was to contain these sort of adversarial, non-democratic activities through sanctions. Those two things, right, sort of like the changes that we saw in the NDAA plus these more sort of comprehensive sanctions across sectors in China and then in other places where we saw similar human rights abuses set a precedent for us to say we can actually reach into the supply chain and we can make comprehensive sanctions to have punitive effects to change behaviors, non-democratic behaviors, or unethical behavior. And man, did we get that right because it set the stage for what we've been able to do in Russia now. We've got an autocrat. We've got a criminal, Tom, a criminal that is slaughtering people for the purposes of self-aggrandizement. That is a crime. And the ability for us to specifically target some of these big parts of how they fund this war, you know, their banking sectors, their commerce with the EU, the EU being willing to take a hit in terms of gas prices, the world being willing to take a hit in inflation, to defend democracy long-term, which will win because individualism and democracy allow for one person to change the world. You know, without democracy, you don't have the light bulb, Tom. Without democracy, you don't have real space exploration. Without democracy, you don't have these things where one person gets the opportunity to make the world better for billions of people. And so we've been able to preserve with this sort of new sanctions regime, our ability to create comprehensive sanctions against countries through critical organizations without compromising key partners like India that are really dependent on a lot of things from Russia. And so I think that it's a complex web. I think people are still trying to get a handle on what it all means. I think the most interesting conversations I'm having with corporations and institutions is in every conversation on sanctions, I ask them one question. Are you still struggling with compliance or are you moving to reputational damage? And it's about 50-50 where people are saying, I'm still struggling with compliance or I'm moving away from compliance. I'm going to reputational damage on this one because, you know, places like Yale have put out lists of people that just aren't quite doing enough. You know, you got a D or an F on Yale's Russian uh, investment or Russian connections list. That's not a good thing for you. So I think sanctions have forever changed. I think now that we've got things like the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act, enforcement into that will continue to change the world. The question is, who enforces these 
types of new issues. You know, I wrote a paper with Center for New American Security where we advocated for an, like sort of OFAC like uh, sanctions enforcement like group in commerce, maybe through BIS, um, the ability for acquisition professionals and DOD and DHS to get involved. And I think DHS is getting some new authorities in terms of cyber to do the same. So I think we're moving towards a world where we've got better enforcement because that's going to make clear that we're serious about getting right the complexities of these sanctions. Brandon, that really brings up the point I wanted to maybe turn to next, and it ties into financial crimes compliance. The trope, the meme, the most visible communication of sanctions is the yachts, the oligarchs' yachts. And everyone understands when they see one of those yachts what that means in terms of sanctions. But tying that back to the AML law of 2020, there was a whistleblower provision with bounties paid for those who turned over information on financial crimes compliance. And we now have literally a cottage industry of people looking for those yachts, trying to find them in places that the U.S. can extradite or seize them and communicating that to public officials. And I really wanted to use that as an example of the higher visibility of financial crimes compliance. You've been in this field for a long time, so this is not new to you. But for many people, this is the first time they're hearing about financial crimes compliance and any money laundering compliance. And there's, in my mind, a huge increase in knowledge and visibility of this because of those yachts. Yeah. Whistleblower provisions, Tom, as you know, have been a major force for change in lots of industries. You and I both worked in energy and in healthcare as you know, we reform those industries from a bribery, corruption, financial crime compliance perspective. I mean, we were both there in the middle of it. And whistleblower provisions, there's some detractors to them, but in a lot of ways they help reform because man, if you incentivize people to say when something's wrong or to help you seize an asset that's ill-gotten or that makes change it does drive some you know, good behavior and really some good prosecution, Tom, right? Because you can get evidence that would otherwise be very difficult to get through the discovery process. So I think that the yachts are a good emblematic way to speak to the people of the excessive wealth that these people that are sort of either passively or actively involved in these atrocities get the opportunity to leverage and to essentially indulge themselves with while the rest of the world is suffering and how important financial crimes compliance and AML whistleblower provisions, but then also AML controls like the ones that were put into the 2020 updates that help you to see who owns those yachts, who owns those assets, who owns those companies, who owns those companies that owns those yachts? I mean, a big part of that is transparency. You and I have said before, transparency, light, sunshine is the best antiseptic. <laughs> and so I think one of the things that I also really hope we take seriously is FinCEN's effort to create this much more comprehensive ownership database, because then I think it gives those Carmen San Diego's of the world, and you might remember that show from like the 80s and 90s, the Carmen San Diego's of the world, the ability to trace down and hunt down some of these assets and help the government in prosecuting unethical behavior. So Brandon, unfortunately, we're near the end of our time for this episode, but I hope our listeners will join us for our next episode where we take up anti-corruption as now a national security issue. I look forward to continuing this conversation. This is Tom Fox. Thank you for listening to this episode of Never the Same, Business After the Ukraine War. This podcast was produced by One Stone Creative, and I want to give a shout out to Megan Doherty, Audra Casano, Darla Field, and the entire team at One Stone Creative. If you are interested in podcasting and need some help, or you want to have a turnkey solution, my suggestion is you would contact one Stone Creative. We're going to link to them in the show notes. On a very personal note, I hope that this podcast series will get you to think and be curious and look at all of the issues we have explored in this podcast series. I really believe we have had a true watershed moment, and I think those who don't understand that will be left in the dust of 2022. This is Tom Fox. 
Thank you again for listening. Never the Same, Business After the Ukraine War is a part of the Compliance Podcast Network.